Good morning, and welcome to our Friday programming for New Space 2013. My name is Dan Pastiff, and I have the pleasure of being the MC for today's proceedings. We're joined here today at a time of ongoing change in the industry, and we'll be hearing throughout the conference on the excellent progress we'll be making. Today's morning theme, Growing Our Space Enterprise, is, the fo is focuses on the gr growth in the coming future, and how we can better leverage our existing relationships to drive the development. Furthermore, more a key role, a key part of today's program would be the International Space Station, how it can serve for the platform of the future. Finally, for this morning, we will conclude our programming with a discussion from industry leaders of, for, on space investment on why now is the time to invest in space. Our afternoon will be focusing on baselines promoting exponential growth and how we can obtain exponential growth today in the industry by using exam examples and successes from the past. Our second ISS panel this afternoon will also address what's being done today and on station right now that has a potential in examples that can be used to, further, to grow tremendously in the upcoming future. And of course, our, we'll conclude our panels today with uh, our War Stories panel this year focusing on financing. Now, before further ado, to introduce our opening keynote, I'd like to, like to introduce Mr. Bob Werb, who is one of the uh, Foundation's founding members. Bob. Good morning. I usually get the crappy jobs, but this morning I get to introduce Lori Garber, which is really kind of a treat. About a year ago, I emailed Lori with, and I ended the email with a sentence that said, if there's anything I can do to help, you need only ask. This seemed like a perfectly ordinary thing for Bob to say to Lori. And it was only after I hit send that I realized how strange it was for the chairman of the Space Frontier Foundation to be saying unconditionally to the deputy administrator of, of NASA that if there's anything I can do to help, she need only ask. But of course, for this particular deputy administrator, it's no problem because she thoroughly understands what the Space Frontier Foundation is and what we stand for. And she would never, ever, ever consider asking me to do something that is not consistent with our beliefs and with who we are. And it's not just because we have a lot of history. I mean, we do have a lot of history. But it's because this is a deputy administrator who says she is, I gotta read this quote, she is working to advance the transformation of NASA into a 21st century agency of innovation. This is a deputy administrator that Space News described as, again a quote, game changer who is helping to pilot NASA through the shark infested waters of Washington politics. That sounds scary. Basically what I'm saying is that what we, what we have here is the first deputy administrator who is one of us. As we like to say in the Space Frontier Foundation, she gets it. And I am confident that I speak for the overwhelming majority of the people both in this room and the much larger audience on the internet when I say that we are enormously proud of the hard work you were doing at NASA to transform it into, how did you put it? <laughs> An agent of innovation. We appreciate the sacrifices that you're making to help expand human civilization into the solar system. And I'm quite sure that if there's anything we can do to help, you need only ask. So please, a warm welcome for Lori Garber. Wow, thank you so much, Bob. You, uh, I will hold you to that, as you know. I have asked a few things over the years, uh, but truly, you are making a huge difference, and uh, I think everybody does uh, recognize when uh, I am here at something like this. People at NASA who are writing uh, speeches probably don't really consider putting a whole lot of time and effort into that because it's probably not going to give whatever it is that they said to write. So luckily I had an airplane ride on the way out and uh, I was able to put a few thoughts together because to me what you folks most often ask about is, you know, how do, you, how do you do it? And how do you, uh, with the background and views that I have, work uh, in, the, in the position I do? And I'm here to tell you that it is really 
a time of progress and opportunity, largely because of the work of this organization and others. So I want to talk about the opportunities and the progress, as well as a few of the challenges. Uh, I had, in trying to frame what I was going to say, looked at this whole, I like these stories, you know, a tale of two cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. I didn't get too far with that, so we'll stick with progress and opportunities, uh, which I think our, our, uh, some of my staff will be happy with. So starting with uh, the opportunity, the best of times, where I think we are, uh, we really are, as an agency, and I think as, a, U, as um, a nation, second to none in space. We are leading the world in space. If you look by almost any measure, we are the envy of the world. Of course, we spend more than all other uh, countries uh, combined, and we truly are advancing a time uh, when I believe civilization will have a sustained uh, presence in uh, space. So what is the challenge there? We, at least at NASA, are at uh, nearly an all-time low as our budget is a percent of GMP. So if I'm going to, with those challenges, just keep in mind that'll be the ask you uh, to help us do something about side of things. Uh, another place that it is the best of times that we've made a lot of progress is that we have six astronauts living and working in space. We really have a spacefaring civilization and have for 13 years on the ISS. They are, as I think Bill Gerstenmeier described yesterday, doing amazing things in space. So what's our challenge? They go to and from there from Kazakhstan. <laughs> so <laughs> on the best of times progress front, we are making great strides at turning that around. We have three competitors still, Boeing, SpaceX, and Sierra Nevada working to shorten the time when that'll be the case, working to, again, be able to launch our astronauts to space station to and from the United States of America on US vehicles. And the benefit is going to be open new markets for not just astronauts to go to in space from America, but take some of those uh, tourism uh, dollars from Russia back here to the United States as well. So we are poised to turn that around. But what's the challenge there? While we have bipartisan support, it still seems to be something that a few key folks on the Hill, whether it's staff or members, you can decide yourselves, uh, seem to want to cut this budget. It has been cut by a larger percent than any other uh, of our proposed budgets. You'd think the program that would be fundamental to the United States bipartisan, something that we want to do, clearly returning in your tax dollar. Why is it that this program is not uh, really having uh, the broader support for the overall request? Again, a lot of progress being made. I, I really don't think whether we're doing it or not is controversial, but it's the typical thing. Well, we'll do it, but we'll only give you half the money and we'll make you do far based cost plus contracts. Other than that, we love it. Another best of times. We have a mission laid out for the next human destination that is very exciting and creative. We rolled out the asteroid retrieval mission. This mission is going to utilize existing capability that NASA already has supported in its budget. It's going to drive technology. It's going to utilize the private sector. It's going to help us find more uh, of these threatening asteroids and comets to protect our very civilization on this planet. It is going to prove uh, a, a lot more about the resource capability and uh, ability to uh, have asteroids being able to help be resources for space development over the future. We are looking to partner in new ways. We put out this RFI. We got over 400 responses to the RFI uh, on partnering on both the asteroid mission and the grand challenge. And we could not be more excited about this opportunity. Again, utilizing, leveraging the systems that NASA is already developing. Go to an asteroid, drive the solar electric propulsion technology, the robotic technology, observations capability, and be able to have astronauts go visit an asteroid, returning a large sample for a study here on Earth. For one to two billion dollars, by the way, for a fraction of the cost of the vehicles we're developing that would be doing this. 
So our challenge is that there are, again, few people, you can argue staff or, or members on the Hill, but in key places, who think this is uh, gonna keep us from going back to the moon uh, or from uh, developing, I think, the very vehicles that we would use to do this mission. So our challenge is to help people understand that is not at all what this mission would do. This doesn't sidetrack anything. This allows us to have a meaningful purpose for these vehicles and for developing a capability that will very much make it easier for us to return to the moon and return to the moon in a sustainable, uh, effective way. So that is gonna be my next best of times. We truly have an increased focus on a sustainable lunar activity, starting with Lunar Prospector and LCROSS, now to Laddie, the Google Lunar X Prize, our work with Bigelow Aerospace, and the recent RFI that we just put out to stimulate robotic lunar uh, transportation services. So this will be our first step in assessing interest for public-private partnerships to jointly develop a robotic lander that could demonstrate technologies that enable research uh, for government and commercial customers on the moon. Does it sound like we're not going back to the moon? We absolutely are as a nation and the government should, as we always have, play that pioneering role that then allows us to have a sustainable uh, development program. Our lunar strategy would open up the moon for a truly sustained human presence and one that would extend our economic sphere of influence, leading ultimately to, I know, the goals of this organization, ultimately space settlement. So what's our challenge? We need to keep people from uh, really uh, trying to either redo Apollo on the moon or from uh, trying to characterize our plan for this asteroid mission uh, to be an either or with uh, lunar activity. It is not, they're synergistic. So our next opportunity in our area of progress in these best of times is our just released Collaboration for Commercial Space RFI. So this is a synopsis requesting uh, U.S. private entities who are interested in pursuing unfunded partnerships with NASA. It's intended to help companies accelerate their development efforts while enabling the nation to reap the epic economic benefits from previous NASA investments. So the idea was forged by Phil McAllister and his wonderful team at NASA um, from really all of the recent increased proposals and interest uh, in space. Lots of those represented here, all the way from uh, the asteroid attention from organizations like B612, Deep Space Industries, Planetary Resources, the lunar private interests, and uh, from folks um, like Golden Spike, and of course, even that commercial private sector interest. Uh, such as we've seen from Dennis Tito and Inspiration Mars. This is an exciting development. We have not only uh, interest from outside organizations in utilizing NASA expertise, again, on a non-exchange of funds basis, but from the NASA side, I can really tell you we're energized by this. Folks at the centers are calling, excited about being able to use our capability to assist others' efforts. It really is, I think, a sea change. Our challenge in this area, I'm, I'm gonna say, is probably um, the uh, limitation on our own resources. One of the reasons we had to put out an RFI was there's so many uh, comers, we can't uh, really have our resources focused on all comers, so we need a way to evaluate those that are gonna be uh, the farthest along and that truly have something that NASA can uniquely uh, help with, so it's, it's not even a, a bad challenge, it's a good challenge. So, my next opportunity is uh, that we are moving forward with a joint solicitation for suborbital research uh, and science flights that will include supporting researchers flying aboard suborbital vehicles. Some of you might have been at the June conference where I made this announcement, and we are still driving forward. This was a great conference to be able to try and get an update on how those implementation plans are going. 
So of course there are a few challenges. We have uh, our bureaucratic process, this seems to be in, but we are moving forward, not quite there yet, and we are gonna need you all to help hold our feet to the fire. An opportunity. It is the best of times with the private sector companies streaming to NASA to utilize our excess capability, right? We were built for Apollo, we know that we are overbuilt for our purpose, but we're probably not overbuilt in many ways for the overall space effort. So these partnerships that uh, we are forging are helping uh, fully utilize our rocket testing facilities, infrastructure, and uh, possibly now even launch facilities. Very excited about these opportunities. So what's our challenge? We need to let the competition actually take place. We need to trust that NASA really and uh, the private sector have all of our best interests in mind to advance uh, the private sector's successful efforts in space. I'll leave it at that since we're in competition. The opportunity that we finally have a private partner uh, really facilitating commercial research on International Space Station in cases. I know Bill Gerstenmeier talked a lot about this yesterday. This really is something, gosh, when I was at NASA in the 90s, we worked to get, and we're thrilled to be, be able to be utilizing space station in a commercial way. Nanoracks, 94 uh, flights, uh, payloads on uh, space station so far commercially. This is truly a great advancement and symbolizes a lot of progress. Challenges, only 15 million for cases, around 50 million for utilization of station beyond our own station, uh, NASA research that we hope to be able to do more of. And I would say we are trying to move a lot of these activities out of NASA to keep them from being too political and there seems to still be some politics in some of these commercial activities. So that's a challenge I would ask for your help with as well. When we are able to do private sector, let's, let's keep the competition and keep it in the private sector. Opportunity. We are working and have been, I think in some ways, uh, having a lot of success, aligning our programs and missions to the more sustainable goals of advancing civilization. Sustainability, as you all know, has to be built into a program at the beginning as a goal in mind. So instead of just setting uh, a, a destination, we need that purpose. We know with Apollo it had a purpose. It was to beat the Soviet Union. So that was not a purpose of sustainability because the purpose was a race. And we achieved it and immediately ramped down again. If our purpose, advancing space for uh, settlement, you know you need to leave a, a sustainable program behind. And you can't just commercialize a program as an afterthought. You look at something like shuttle. I know several administrators really wanted to commercialize shuttle, but we didn't build it in. The operations costs were much too high. If you had started with that goal, you would have had uh, focused up front liquid flyback boosters. So you would have reduced the operations costs at an exchange of the development costs. Same with station. Who doesn't remember the industrial space facility? That was a choice we made. We weren't gonna focus on that as a purpose. Fine, those have different purposes and they have certainly on the station geopolitical purposes, but it's gonna be harder to fully get that off the books and commercialize because we didn't bake it in up front. Someone like Bigelow, someone having a space uh, station that has the end goal in mind of sustainability is uh, going to be more successful, most likely, at ultimately uh, having uh, those lower costs. Same with the lunar program, as I was talking about. So we all know that um, the goals, I think, for advancing civilization, I talk about a lot, the purposes, we need to align better with what we're going to do for sustainability. So we have those goals of protecting the planet now with our asteroid mission, that's part of uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, of course, space station, geopolitics, a peaceful world, a prosperous world, prosperity, and pride. So what's the challenge? Still tend to be a little too much about the pork. We definitely know that we have uh, self-interested constituencies in everything we do. It's government dollars, that's what it's about. So in my mind, you can try and have sustainable programs in a couple of ways. You can make them so big, too big to fail, right? We've, we've heard it before. We have programs 
advancing in that way. Or you can do, I think, with a sustainable program, have take smaller bites, shorter time scales, get more of that public excitement, things that we really believe are aligned with how we're structuring the asteroid mission, to be able to do it within a reasonable period of time and drive down the costs so that when we are doing those larger things, the operations costs are lower and we're able to sustain the program. So you can focus on those steps in a way that advance technology and a capability that someone besides the taxpayer is willing to pay uh, for it over the long term. So I want to lay out a lot of the progress we've made while I acknowledge the challenges. And yesterday while I was on the plane, I uh, was sitting next to a gentleman from Silicon Valley who absolutely loves the space program. I told him I'd give him a shout, shout out, uh, D.B. Banjeri, and he works, uh, as I said, in Silicon Valley in banking, actually. And I told him I like to do a top 10 list. I told him about the conference, and I was trying to think of how to, how to close with you know, one of my infamous top 10 lists. And we decided there are a lot of similarities between new space and Silicon Valley. So I'm going to give you uh, the top 10 ways that new space is like Silicon Valley. OK? So number 10, new space is working to drive the cost of going to space down, while Silicon Valley is working to drive the, pro the cost of their stock up so they can buy a ticket with us. <laughs> number nine, Silicon Valley wants to own their own self-driving cars like they have at Google. New Space wants their own self-driving robots like NASA has on Mars. <laughs> Come on, it's funny. <laughs> Number eight, New Space hasn't had much more luck with their space elevator than Silicon Valley has had extending the BART. <laughs> So see, I was asking him, like, what are some of your challenges in Silicon Valley? Public transportation. Number seven, <laughs> both Silicon Valley and New Space like to blame who they believe is their number one enemy, government. <laughs> I asked him, I said, who's your number one enemy? Like, you know, he said, you. <laughs> it's a little awkward. Uh, number six. Silicon Valley people are now forced to have virtual friends on Facebook. Sorry, I was working. Uh, we're forced in New Space to have virtual conferences because of sequester. <laughs> Number five, Silicon Valley led the way to store civilization's data on the cloud. New Space is working to store civilization's data on the moon. Number four, the best RFI response from New Space for our asteroid retrieval mission uh, to save money, they proposed sending an astronaut out in a spacesuit with just Google glasses and an Apple Watch. <laughs> Number three, New Space is proposing to use Airbnb to book nights on the space station. Who's heard of Airbnb? Okay, I hadn't heard of it. He said, he promised me. He promised me it's a thing. <laughs> Number two. Men in New Space and Silicon Valley seem to not uh, prefer to wear ties, and both Silicon Valley and New Space require a lot more women. <laughs> Someone told me it's known as San Brose. Okay, and the number one way New Space and Silicon Valley are the same. It's both are responsible for advancing the most productive, positive, and meaningful, meaningful innovations that are truly advancing civilization. And I thank you both. I said I'd take questions, right? We can probably hear you, right. or I can repeat it. So um, the, the word that you used most commonly was excited. So I would get you're excited, and people at NASA are excited, and most clearly the people in this room are excited and listening on the web. 
And the issue you pointed to is there's 540 some odd people, or at least some of them, most of them, are not excited. And I think that's also somewhat reflective of what I get from the public. And so the two questions I have is, one, how come? And secondly, since that's a big issue, what, what are NASA's ideas for dealing with that uh, lack of excitement? And you know, it's not that you're not doing great stuff, but I don't think if you talk to the people on the street, they think the manned space program is over and does NASA still exist? So I'll disagree a bit with the premise because I really uh, do believe, keeping with the theme, we have made a lot of progress in, in, in this area. There are, through um, social media and all the things that Silicon Valley has allowed us to do, NASA number one in government. Let's face it, we are, we are government. NASA has the best brand in the world, maybe second only to Apple, and we are, I think, being able to see a lot of public support and even congressional support. It's an interesting time because while budgets are coming down overall, this is not directed specifically at NASA. We just live in the world that exists today. And so in making the best of it, I think we're actually poised to do well because NASA has never uh, been the only thing in the space program. If we focused our resources, again, 17 billion, 16 billion, we can enable and are enabling a truly uh, amazing space program that does advance uh, civilization. So I think what is needed, and since uh, I know folks want to help, is that better description of how we spend the dollars. We can argue, and we of course would always love to have a larger share of uh, the public tax dollar, but as uh, folks shrink those uh, dollars overall, NASA can step up to do our share if we focus those dollars in a way that provides more return. And I actually think that's very, very exciting to people. I recognize that retiring the shuttle was our, our most visible program and has caused a lot of folks to believe that human spaceflight uh, as best days are behind us. It is far from truth. We know that there will be, because we're investing in these programs, more and more people able to go to space. And I think we're poised to see uh, a lot of advancements in that area, and that in itself is going to help. So we need to uh, hang in there and, and focus what we have. I actually believe that's how you get more, is when people see the investment they're spending is really paying off. And so it is a way to be able to, uh, at the same time as you're advancing private sector, potentially grow uh, what we're doing as well. Yes. Hi. It's working. Um, like you said, CASIS has come along, and I'd like to point out that this gentleman here proposed a CASIS 15 years ago, and uh, I, I, I am very, very happy to be dealing with CASIS. We're continuing to fly experiments uh, on the station right now, uh, but my question from a business standpoint is that we've got a, basically a drop dead date at 2020. We know that there's a conversation going on in the back rooms that to extend that, possibly out to 2028, but I think we really need to start from a business standpoint to start that conversation within the next couple of years so at least we have some kind of idea where that's going. Thanks, Richard. Uh, yeah, Bob and I talked about that at least 15 years ago, and we at NASA, if you can believe it, worked to do it back then. You know, Mark Uran had, had actively, like, that was his job for that long, and finally we get it. And, he leaves, I think he just worked so hard on it. The um, extension of space station is something actively being discussed, I wouldn't say in back rooms and open rooms and rooms like this, and it needs to be discussed. Because station costs uh, $2.8 billion a year, taxpayer dollars, and we're spending how much on utilization? 50 to 100 million dollars. So we need to get those more in line, I, I would argue, for us to be able to say, hey, the right path is after the next seven years to extend it. Uh, and as I talked about, there might be ways to be able to lower those costs. There's certainly transportation is a big part of those costs, so we need to continue to focus on reducing our transportation costs. And we need to be able to facilitate more of the research so we can see what the value is truly of doing that uh, commercial research in space. So, we believe there is going to be a value, and we have with a NASA need to go beyond 2020 with station just purely to do the research on astronauts living and working in space so that they can go farther. Our goals beyond the asteroid to go to Mars are really going to only be enabled 
by that presence in space. And uh, we don't believe we'll have the research done either on the life sciences or the technologies needed, radiation protection, those kind of things beyond. So of course we need that beyond 2020. What we've got to work to do is get the operational cost down and the utilization, uh, if, if not income, at least uh, capability, capability up. So uh, I think it is, of course, something we want to be able to be uh, extending. We got a lot of work to do, I think, uh, to make that really to be the, ne the best uh, thing to do beyond 2020. Yes? Lori, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, Dallas Beanhoff. Hi, Dallas. Hi, how are you? Um, given the House is playing games with the ARM budget, would NASA consider uh, putting that out as a prize to bring the asteroid back to their designated location and then send, going out to use it as a way to save money? Why or why not? So I hope you submitted that as an RFI. It was submitted. 404 is now our, now what do we have, 403? So over 400 responses. I'm sure that's in there. And of course, we need to think about creative ways to do that. Uh, the, I think the draft, at least on the auth side, w the uh, anapropes, I guess, forbid us from doing it until we respond to a lot of reporting and, and those kind of things. So my, my view is, we have not only, and we've just started, I think, to read these RFI responses, going to have uh, really creative ways to go do this, but we can potentially and are looking to align the mission with some of the goals that we know the House, and I think a lot of us have, which is if we're saying this is going to help us protect the planet, maybe being able to go to a larger asteroid so that we can drive specifically the observations for large asteroids that are actually threats to us. We've increased our budget $20 million. We've quintupled the budget five times for detection since we've come to office, and we believe if we can align this with going to a larger asteroid, taking a piece of that asteroid and moving it, you might uh, be able to get answer some of the questions of the folks who believe this is uh, not as meaningful as we believe it is, but doing it in a creative way is absolutely uh, on the table for being able to not only have, uh, as you said, the uh, House folks be able to get on board, but it's, it's the right thing to do. Bruce. Thanks, Lori. Time for one more. Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks for coming. I know it's uh, difficult to, uh, to travel in these uh, times, so um, I, I wanted to thank you for, for making the effort to come out here. Uh, we all appreciate it. Um, I'm sure that Jeff Grayson will be very happy that you used the S word. Um, uh, that, that we're really excited about that. You know, the, the whole idea that, that ultimately the goal should be settlement, I think, is, is something that we need to start memeing out. Um, one of the things that you know, when you first became deputy administrator, you talked about value propositions. And it seems to me one of the value propositions that we could do here is the, for the people on planet Earth, is that the knowledge that we gain and learning how to be sustainable out there might help us be sustainable uh, down here. And uh, are you guys working that at the, at, the, uh, at the headquarters level to kind of look at that? We're spending a lot of money on Earth sciences and things like that. There's some amazing data out there um, and slightly horrifying, um, but, uh, but I think NASA has a lot to bring to bear on this issue, and we were just wondering if you, uh, if you guys were thinking about that. Of course. I mean, when I say aligning our activities, our missions, our programs with national priorities, protecting the planet isn't just about asteroids. It's about understanding what's happening here on our planet, and Earth science is another part of the budget that we have continued to request increases for. The value proposition of much of this, as you know and taught me, is really uh, what it's all about. And if uh, initially in your question I thought you were going to the things we're doing in space, like on space station, having us here, of, of course. But we all know that if, if your end goal was that, you wouldn't necessarily spend what we're spending on those things to advance it. So I'm really cognizant of not just making up uh, reasons for for the budgets we have, but having them focus on things that we uniquely can do, and what what we believe. Then you take all the benefits from that. You have to do it in a way that returns the technologies that will have broader markets that then will get greater investment and being able to have the funding to then do the next hard thing because we're about innovation. 
Silicon Valley is about innovation. That is what has returned and made our economy and this country great. And so that's why it says in my bio that that is my goal, it has been my goal at NASA. We are that beacon uh, on the hill where the uh, crown jewels that the country, whenever you uh, leave the United States, people look to as NASA, and we just need to keep leading and being in front so that uh, the, the nation and the world will continue uh, to advance. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for everything you're doing. It's great to see you.